Hello and welcome to this latest Lowy Institute online event. Thanks for joining us. My name is Ben Bland and I'm the director of the Southeast Asia program here at the Lowy Institute in Sydney. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking, the Gadigal people of the Uyora Nation, and paying my respects to their elders past and present. I'm joined today by four esteemed panelists who will be discussing what the world can do about the deepening crisis in Myanmar. Uh, first up, Kin Omar is a veteran human rights activist from Myanmar who fled the country after the 1988 democracy uprising. She runs an organization called Progressive Voice. Next, Scott Marcial is a former US diplomat who was ambassador to Myanmar until last year. And he previously served as ambassador to Indonesia and to ASEAN. Scott is now a visiting scholar and practitioner fellow at Stanford University. Next, we have Rizal Sukma, an Indonesian foreign policy expert who's also a former ambassador in his case to the United Kingdom. And he was also formerly in a foreign policy advisor to Indonesian President Joko Widodo. He's currently now a senior researcher at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta, which Rizal used to run before joining the diplomatic service. And last but not least, of course, we have Janelle Safin, who's a Labour MP in the New South Wales Parliament. She spent decades working on development and legal issues related to Myanmar. She founded the Australia Myanmar Parliament Group, and she's also worked as a special advisor to Jose Ramos Horta, the former president of Timor Leste. So since seizing power in a coup on February the 1st, Myanmar's military has embarked on a violent campaign of repression. The Tatmadaw, as it's known, has killed hundreds of peaceful protesters and detained thousands of people, including Australian economist Sean Turnell, who's a friend of the Lowy Institute, and I'm sure many other people on this call. The outside world has responded in a range of ways. The US, UK and European Union have implemented targeted sanctions against the Tatmadaw. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, held a special summit last month calling for a halt to the violence and the appointment of a special envoy. Meanwhile, Myanmar's biggest neighbors, China and India, seem to be taking a wait and see approach. And the UN Security Council, of course, remains divided as ever. So how can the world best influence the Tatmadaw, which has previously proven so impervious to external pressure? Before I go to, to our guests, some quick housekeeping. If you have any questions, please ask them by the Q&A function on Zoom. Include the, your name and the name of your organization or affiliation, and we hope to get to as many questions as possible. First, Kin Omar, I want to start by asking you about the current state of play on the ground in Myanmar. We know that the Tatmadaw has stepped up its campaign of violent repression against the democracy movement. And I want to ask you, has that succeeded in taking the wind out of the sails of the civil disobedience movement and the protests that we'd seen uh, in the first few weeks and first couple of months after the coup? No, Ben, they have not been successful yet. Um, I would say that their attempted coup since February 1st is in fact, it's failing. So also that's why it's really important for the international community to not, not to normalize this coup and not to recognize or cooperate with the, this hunter because the people's uh, movement is very strong and vibrant. You know, I was from the 1988 pro-democracy movement compared to our, our time. The current movement is extremely resilient and strong and so determined also that civil disobedience movement has now effectively prevented this military from controlling the administration of the government, banks, hospitals, and other, other sectors, you know. So that's why I'm saying that this coup is, is in effect, it is failing. Um, but also, of course, as you said, uh, there is the, 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 like, you know, how much of that, like a daily, like a day and night experience that people are, are facing is just unbearable. But in spite of that, I would say in spite of the now, the time has come for the, the, the schools to reopen. And you see like now, you see all of these uh, people coming up again, uh, the teachers and students together uh, on the streets and, and they are now uh, uh, demonstrating again and saying that what they're saying is military slavery education is not wanted. So they are not going back to school. So that's where the, the, this, uh, the resilience, how strong the resilience and um, the vibrant the movement is, yeah. And I know that this protest movement, unlike previous ones perhaps, is more leaderless, it's more diffuse and, and dispersed. And there are many different groups and people involved in, in the labor strikes you mentioned, in the protests on the street, even potentially armed resistance. But is there consensus, do you think, from 
uh, Myanmar people about what they would like to see from the world to help advance their cause of democracy in Myanmar? Well, first and foremost, uh, people have been calling out uh, for the international community to help immediately is to stop the violence, to prevent further atrocities by this military hunter. But uh, that's not coming. That is not coming. Not from the ASEAN, not from the United Nations, not from Security Council. Uh, of course, there are you know, like, a, a plot, like a plausible, uh, plausible uh, um, uh, actions being taken from the United Nations, I'm sorry, the US, U UK and EU. Uh, but we're not seeing you know, some of the very, very uh, important countries, including Australia. And the Australian government is not taking the concrete actions yet. So for the people of Myanmar, uh, they know that, you know, like in spite of them, uh, you know, telling the whole world what they want and sacrificing their lives, especially the young people. But there is no nobody coming to help them to stop this violence. So yes, now you see the the the, the movement is quite uh, 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 vibrant and varied in terms of their tactics. You know, many of the non non civil disobedience movement, non violence uh, tactics are are also employed uh, 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 employed. Uh, very, very homegrown, really creative, and you know, like really creative um, uh, actions are taking place. But at the same time that you have seen, I'm sure you've seen in the news as well, there are many people who are fleeing into the ethnic controlled, um, ethnic revolutionary control areas where they are taking the arms, arm, arms trainings. And, and you know, like, so there are the, the, the movement, in, in fact, the, the tech has been quite diversified now. And I can, I can only tell you that, you know, like uh, for the people of Myanmar, what they want is, you know, like a, they, they, they want the, the international community to stop this violence because that's the only way for them to move forward and to achieve democracy, you know. But if nobody is able to uh, help them and stop this violence, they have no, no other options left but to defend themselves. And I think this is something that to me, you know, from the coming from the first lost generation of the 1988, I'm so worried of another lost generation that is a, a, a great, uh, you know, like a, a, a potential of a great loss again, which I hope that the world sees it and help the Myanmar people stop, you know, like this military violence and help them achieve democracy back. We're gonna get on to the question of what Australia and, and the US should be doing, but I wanna to turn to, to ASEAN first. And I want to ask you, Pat Rizal, about the special leaders summit that was held in Jakarta uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so this summit, which was held really after a lot of pressure from President Joko Widodo, uh, there was officially a consensus reached by ASEAN. Uh, there was a call to end the violence in Myanmar, to promote constructive dialogue, and also to send a special envoy uh, from ASEAN to Myanmar to meet what, what they agreed was all concerned parties. Uh, but no sooner had Senior General Min Aung Hlaing, who, who led the coup, returned to, to Myanmar, than the military junta distanced itself from this consensus, saying it was going to focus instead on restoring its version of law and order. So, so what's the next move for ASEAN, uh, Rizal? And, and what can the member states of ASEAN, apart from Myanmar, uh, do to enforce uh, this consensus and to hold the junta to it? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, of course, you know, I think, you know, ASEAN should just, you know, uh, move ahead with the, with the plan and, and, and also uh, 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 with, with the appointment of the envoy. That is critical you know, because once, you know, we have the envoy, then the envoy, you know, would immediately, you know, focus on the issue and then try to uh, find ways to implement the uh, uh, three main outcomes, actually, which is, you know, uh, stop the violence and then, of course, the uh, delivery of humanitarian assistance and you know, to initiate inclusive you know, dialogue if you know, needed uh, and asked you know, by the, the Burmese people themselves. And, and this is, I think, you know, where we are at the moment. And I shared uh, some frustrations with you know, Kin uh, in a different form, you know, because I'm quite frustrated with the fact that you know, it's almost two weeks and then you know, this envoy has not been appointed yet. So you know, we, we really need to put pressure on, 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 on ASEAN, on the chair of ASEAN you know, to actually start doing it because Whatever you know, the, the general you know said in uh, Yangon is actually to be expected. You know, of course, he would say that you know you know he wanted to do it himself. But you know, I think uh, ASEAN already has the foundation, if you like, you know, to move forward. Uh, we don't know yet, you know, how far or how long it will take. But you know, that is starting point. So we need to press ahead by appointing the envoy and then by you know talking to all the groups you know in Myanmar in order for this envoy to make a visit. 
And, and Scott, you were a former ambassador to, to ASEAN. You, you worked with the organization when you were uh, the US ambassador in, in Yangon as well and in many other capacities. I mean, we all know that ASEAN has its limits as a consensus organization. Most of its members are not democracies. I mean, do you think ASEAN should be doing more? And what levers of power do you think its member states could potentially be pulling to try and ensure that this consensus is actually implemented? I'm sure, Ben. Well, I agree with Pat Rizal about the need to move ahead. Um, I give ASEAN credit, uh, particularly uh, Indonesia, President Joko Widodo, as you said, for pushing for this summit and coming up with a consensus. It didn't satisfy everybody. It didn't do enough. But given that it's a consensus organization, um, it was at least a good start. I think ASEAN is one of the few entities that has a chance to pry open the door a little bit uh, in, in Myanmar to try to make some progress. I guess my, my one recommendation or suggestion, knowing having dealt with the generals quite a bit uh, without much success, I might add, um, I think it's fairly unrealistic to expect them to change their current behavior um, without feeling a lot more pressure. And I know it's not really the ASEAN way to overtly pressure, but I, my own sense is that um, from ASEAN's perspective, there needs to be some consequences for the generals if they continue to ignore um, what ASEAN's doing. Uh, again, as Paul Rizal said, the first step seems to me to be to appoint the envoy, try to get the envoy into the country, uh, see if the envoy can meet not only the military, but representatives of the National Unity Government and others uh, to get a clearer picture. But again, without some uh, painful consequences for the generals, if they refuse or if they fail to cooperate, I just think it's really unlikely that they will. And last, I don't think it, this is sometimes put on, well, the world's waiting for ASEAN to solve this problem. I don't think that's fair to ASEAN. Um, ASEAN, I think, can be a leading, the leading edge, but just as what happened when uh, ASEAN helped open the door for the world to help Myanmar after Cyclone Nargis in 2008, I think the United States, Australia, other countries uh, need to continue to work with ASEAN and in support of ASEAN rather than say, ASEAN, why haven't you fixed this yet? And so just to come to put that question, if you like, back to, to you, Rizal, I mean, are there levers that, that ASEAN can use to potentially punish the junta if it, if it doesn't comply? I mean, obviously, some people have talked about even suspending its membership. Is that possible or likely? And are there any other kind of sticks that ASEAN can use as well as its many carrots? Well, you know, there is, well, if you look at, you know, the, the charter, you know, there is no, uh, provisions in the charter, you know, on how to suspend, even how to expel, and there is also no provision on how to quit ASEAN. So it's not like the EU, you can just quit like the, the UK did. But in ASEAN, once you join, you get stuck, you know, and then <laughs> so you, you cannot, you know, leave, and then others, you know, cannot also kick you out. But, you know, having said that, you know, individual member states can, of course, you know, take a certain uh, uh, steps or measures if, if they like. For one, you know, I think you know, if one member disagree with, say, participation of a representative of the Tan Madao in ASEAN meeting, then the meeting will not take place because the consensus, right? So you can just object. Say, say Indonesia would say, I will object to any participation by the SAC representative unless they stop the killing. Then the happen will not actually, you know, uh, happen. So that's the leverage that individual member state has over ASEAN as a whole. But of course, nobody wants to come to that point yet, you know. So no, we, we, we try, like, you know, uh, Ambassador uh, Scott Marcia said that, you know, we do have the starting point. It's not much, but, you know, we have to focus on that and, and try to explore how we can actually uh, capitalize on that consensus and then move move ahead. And then let's see how the, the Tadmada or SAC, you know, would, would react to that. Uh, because, you know, at, at, at the end, they also understand that there are consequences, also diplomatic consequences on the part of, of, of uh, ASEAN that, can, uh, that ASEAN can impose on on them. Or the second point that I would like to make, and I think uh, is pro probably is not so much like international community work to support ASEAN, ASEAN is you know, taking the lead. But I think, you know, everyone uh, must work, you know, according to their you know, uh, leverage and also position. So that all works will contribute. So it's easy to spot, you know, weaknesses, you know, in one particular organization or one particular country's you know, approach. But at the end, we have to synergize those, you know, effort. Because it has to be multi-approach, multi-levels, you know, 
and also you know multi strategies in order to really uh, get the breakthrough you know, in, in Myanmar. I think that, that's a really good point, uh, Pat Rizal, because I think it's true that many countries um, around the world have a similar objective here, even you might argue China. Uh, to see some sort of restoration of stability, uh, the release of Aung San Suu Kyi and other political prisoners. And there are just very different ways that countries work. So of course, ASEAN or China will never embrace the sort of sanctions uh, that we've seen the US and the UK and the EU take. But it, in terms of kind of a pragmatic approach to bring people together, I, I want to ask you, Janelle, about Australia's role. I mean, Australia does have this reputation for pragmatic, ambitious, middle power diplomacy, tackling regional conflicts from Cambodia to Timor-Leste. But I think it's fair to say the government response so far from Canberra has been pretty timid. Um, so what, what do you think Australia sh should be doing to try and bring together these kind of disparate views from different countries? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, they have to make a decision that they want to act, that they want to take stronger action and that they want to be involved in you know, the processes, either the bilateral, multilateral, and obviously as a dialogue partner of ASEAN, you know, working there within the quad, um, had the successful meeting recently, you know, it's getting legs again. So within the quad, so with the US um, and Japan and India, there's a range of areas we can work in, but we have to, you know, Australia has to say, I'm ready to step up and play that role. And there's pressure from the community and I get people worldwide, you know, state actors and civil society asking me why they haven't yet. They've been, it's a bit like watch and see. And initially um, it, they were concerned because of um, Dr. Sean Tunnell being detained and stepped a bit gingerly around that. And I agree with that, I've been involved. Um, but as time goes on, it really is time to step up. But what they can do is consider the financial sanctions and the ones that hurt the hip pocket of General Minong Line and the people around him. So really consider that seriously. That requires resourcing to work out who's who, how you do it, understanding banking, the legal basis of it, et cetera. Uh, Recognise the national unity government you know, I'm not naive about how state actors <laughs> work and do that, but we have to push for that because that's really important. And I say recognition, but even just talking with them, you know, talking with the foreign minister, talking with the minister for women, children and youth affairs, because there's a whole range of violence being perpetrated um, against women has been for a long time. And also look at diplomatic ways like we've got the regional well, beyond that but we've got the regional economic com comprehensive partnership with listeners and um, our panel would be familiar and that was signed in November last year and it's yet to be ratified later this year Myanmar's one of the partners and do we want General Minong line in that? Our trade with Myanmar, Australia's trade, is really infinitesimal, so it's small. And we, working at, within the UN, put pressure on for a Security Council resolution. We know the one we'd like will go down with Russia and China, but we still need to pressure and work that fora as well in many ways and the credentials committee that issue will come up in September we need to be on board I mean and by not recognizing the NUG and the CRPH in some way in some form and having dialogue with them it's a tacit recognition of General Minong Line and the State Administration Council and that's not a good place to be. If ASEAN can step up like it has, and yes, there's all sorts of, you know, they could, could be better, you know, could be faster, it could be stronger, all of that. They've stepped up. We can step up too. What have we got to lose? There's nothing for us to lose. Reputationally, um, it's better that we do step up because that's the one thing people expect us to do. I actually have a list of about 35 actions, but I won't, 
I'll spare everyone right now, <laughs> but that needs someone to say, we're going to do this, we're going to focus on it, do a big round table and then resource it and reach out to everybody. But well, Janelle, if you if you send me your send us your list or tell us where it's been posted online, we'll happily, happily share it around. Um, <laughs> But I, I just wanted on this question of what outside powers can do, we'll come on to the national unity government in a second, but I have to come back to you here, Scott, obviously with, you know, Australia is a middle power, but the US is a great power. The Biden administration has said that it will put you know, democracy in a much more important place in its foreign policy. And obviously the US government has brought in targeted sanctions very quickly on the Tatmadaw. But, but what more do you think the US government could be doing to actually support uh, the democracy movement in Myanmar beyond a bit of pressure on, on the generals? Where's the room for more movement for the US government here? Right. I would say this for the US, but also for probably a lot of other countries. Um, it's it's really important first to do no harm. And by that, I, I echo Janelle's point, doing nothing to confer legitimacy mm -hmm. on the Supreme Administrative Council, that the junta, um, that's critical. Um, and to make it clear that, that we and others are on the side of the people, um, whether it's formal recognition of the NUG or just um, dialogue and the like, um, that's, it, that's very important. I think um, trying to cut off as much as possible sources of revenue to the junta, and that's always tricky. We got a lot of criticism in the past, um, fairly or not, for having broad sanctions against Myanmar because it was seen that it, it hurt a lot of ordinary people. It's very tricky now because many people, uh, this whole civil disobedience movement is trying to make the place ungovernable, including by causing an economic shutdown. It's one thing for the Myanmar people to make that decision because they're the ones who are bearing the brunt of it. It's harder as a foreign country to say, ah, let's go ahead and help them destroy their economy. Uh, so, but I think the targeted sanctions continuing to look at at what makes sense. I think it's important to be practical because sometimes people will throw out an idea. Um, like, you know, in our case, I always will hear the US should ban the import of jade because the military mm -hmm. makes a lot of money on jade. Great, except we don't import jade. Um, pretty much all the jade goes to China. So we could put a ban on, but it doesn't have any practical effect. So I think just looking through these things. Third, I think uh, as much as possible, and this is for governments, but also private organizations, um, taking advantage of the various entities that are out there to get um, a humanitarian assistance in, not through the junta, but through other ways, through civil society groups and others, uh, including through other countries, um, to help sustain the population while they're going through this really difficult period. Uh, the, the, risk, the economy is already collapsing. The healthcare system with COVID is, is overwhelmed. Uh, there's a need for a huge amount of health assistance, some of which can be done in border areas. So there's a lot of help to, a lot of work to be done by governments and others to support the people, literally support the people, uh, help them get through this. And on this question of the, the National Unity Government, I want to come to you next, uh, Kin Omar. So the, the National Unity Government was set up by MPs, ousted MPs from the previously ruling National League for Democracy and representatives of other uh, ethnic organizations and parties. Uh, the National Unity Government has called for international recognition, and it's even looking to establish an armed People's Defense Force to fight the Tatmadaw. Uh, but Kin Omar, my question for you is, I mean, can, from the outside, should we see the national unity government as you know, an organization that's able to actually run the country? Or is this more like a kind of shadow government that kind of reflects people's will, but, but can't actually, obviously, for now, control the government because the junta obviously has its hands on, on many of the levers of power? Uh, ben, I wouldn't call as shadow government. I would call a legitimate interim government. It's only because the illegitimate unlawful hunter is trying to uh, take over the country. Um, when you ask like whether they have the control over the country, the, the NUG, I would say yes. Uh, the very reason I'm saying that is because this very strong civil disobedience movement comprised of civil servants, you know, including the ministries in Nepido, the, the you know, Ministry of Staffs in Nepido, as well as the police and soldiers and, and public and private sector workers, like including the health workers and uh, education workers, they are all together with the NUG. 
And they're not taking the order from the, the military hunter, but instead they're taking the order from the, since the time of the CRPH, such as like forming the local administration committees, taking control of their own administration. If you actually listen and hear, you will actually see many of the places are controlled by the people themselves. They are actually, they are, they are already like running this administration by themselves. And, and, and in that sense, that the NUG is not a parallel, I mean, sorry, not a parallel, uh, not a shadow, but it is an interim government. Of course, it is uh, very challenging because they've been under the severe attack. They, they, they've been under the under severe attack by this military individually, as well as, as the, the government, of course, since the, the February 1st. So it is very um, normal for them to be able like uh, to be operating in a very unusual uh, abnormal you know, like uh, unusual circumstances and environment and, and the nature of the work that they have to do but that's the very reason that's the very reason we are we're, ca we're, we're calling on the international community like Janelle already said we would like the international community international governments to see that the NUG is the people representative legitimate government in fact right now the the, the permanent representative, the ambassador to the United Nations in New York, uh, uh, Mr. John Moto, he is actually, he is uh, the, the ambassador appointed by the NUG. So what we have is, it is a legitimate government. So we, I think we really need the, the, the international community to understand that. But at the same time, I would like to also say that our country, ever since we gained independence from British in 1948, we never had a chance to really work on the nation building process. We never had it because ever since 1962, that was the first military coup. 1988, another military coup, but, but the military coup by the state, by the same military, you know? So now this is another one, right? So while, we, while we're having this military coup after one after another by the same military institution, which is blocking all the people of Myanmar all the people of Myanmar from like a different ethnicity, you know, like a very diverse, you know, ethnicity with a very rich tradition of their own, own independence. But now coming together, wanting to have this federal democracy, but this military continue to remain as a stumbling block. I think like, you know, for everybody, uh, all the international governments who've been engaging with this country, who want to see the good in this country, which is also going to be good for you know, all, of, all of the, the, the international community, that the, the, it, it, it is a very clear, they have to see very clearly that the military is the one who is a, the major stumbling block, while the people are trying so hard to work towards the, this, this federal democracy for them to be able to move forward. I think if, the international community don't support the people's call. I don't know what else they're going to support. So in that people's call, the call is one of the call is to support this uh, to support this legitimate people representative national unity government. Of course, it is not perfect yet. You know, by by the, the coming together in the under the current circumstances, and how can they actually operate when the whole uh, the capital has been seized under the under the seize of this this illegitimate military hunter? But what I'm trying to say here is, this is the this is the government who need to be able to who need to who need the support in order for Myanmar people to move forward. I think that is so important, you know, for us to really uh, see that. Okay. And I just and want, yeah. Can yeah, I sorry, just, I, I just want to sort of put, put, push this back to Pat Rizal though, because I want to get a sense of how realistic this is. You know, you're, you're a foreign policy realist. I mean, do you think there's any chance that the Indonesia or the governments of Southeast Asia would ever recognize the national unity government and if not, is there some sort of gray zone in between where they can find a way to open channels of communication at least without formally recognizing the national unity government? Well, I think, uh, you know, it, it's hard to go into that, you know, recognition game, you know, but, you know, what I can tell you is actually, you know, it's very clear that the SAC or the Tatmadaw is not legitimate, you know, a, a ruling party, you know, government in, in, in Myanmar because ASEAN in 2005, already issued, you know, a joint communique or an, an, an understanding that ASEAN should never condone any unconstitutional, you know, takeover or change of government. Then that 2005, even though after that, you know, ASEAN didn't do anything when the junta in Thailand, you know, also did a coup. And then another coup, you know, in, in, in Thailand as well. But this time, you know, I think 
you know, there is this clearer understanding within ASEAN that you know we should never allow any coup, you know, because there is no good coup or bad coup like what how they describe in Thailand. Coup is all bad. You know, saying we should not accept a coup as the mechanism to change, you know, government. So this, you know, Myanmar crisis is actually demonstrate that because you know everyone in ASEAN really want to put a stop to that. You know, want to tell the SEC that you know you're not really legitimate. And also, you know, this is I think Ambassador Scormesio would understand better that you know symbolic, symbolically speaking, nobody referred to the general as the head of government when he was in Jakarta. All of them actually referred to him as the commander of the armed forces or the, 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 the commander of the Tan Mado. That I think is quite you know, uh, uh, critical. Uh, if you, know, you expect that all ASEAN who officially formally recognize NUG, I don't see that you know, wrong happening because you know, it's very difficult to get even the date for the summit, remember? Let alone you know, on this particular sensitive you know, issue uh, uh, you know, among the ASEAN member states. And Janelle, I, I want to come to you with a question, actually, from uh, Nicholas Koppel, who's a former Australian ambassador as well in, in Yangon. I mm. mean, he's asked, how does recognition of the national unity government end the coup? How does it actually help stop the violence and move things forward? Isn't it just symbolic, even if it were to happen? Symbolism is important and it's practiced all the time, as Nicholas would know as a diplomat. So symbolism and posture is important. And it's giving a message to the General Minong line that you're not legitimate, you're not acceptable, and it's not devoid of mounting pressure to stop the violence. So it's not an either or, but I understand where Nicola's question's coming from. So that's what I would say there. And I do understand about how difficult it will be for some to give recognition, but you've got to call for the ideal and then work with what we have. And I've said short of recognition, absolute dialogue, talking, inclusion, et cetera. And um, one thing, um, um, as Scott said, it was about, you know, how it can be difficult with the financial sanctions. We know a lot more about the economy and where the general's money is now than we ever did before. So there's groups working on that at the moment and looking at the legal basis of seizing some to go into escrow and things like that. So it is difficult, but we know more. And um, because with the economy, the only people trashing the economy is General Minong Line um, and people. One other thing, the, and I think it was um, Pak Rizal, you mentioned about the constitutionality and things like that. There's an Asian constitutional courts and equivalent institutions grouping with 19 members. I think General Minong Line's just been invited to Kazakhstan to talk about their constitutional issues, but some of the ASEAN and other players are in that. And so these are all the mechanisms we need to look at. There are many and, um, you know, work on things like that. ODA, IDA, we really have to redirect a lot of that to civilian, um, uh, you know, activities. And I know that the UN are discussing that at the moment. I just saw Samantha Powers just been endorsed as head of USAID. So <laughs> I'm sure Scott will be talking to Sam. <laughs> and, you know, there's, so we need to reach out and make sure that happens. And um, just one other point. So I, you know, I went off track a bit, but I did answer Nicholas's question. It's a really important posture by people to be engaged with the NUG. Last point, CRPH, that is the parliamentary body. I'm very engaged with them and they're engaged with the IPU, Interparliamentary Union, 179 parliaments. And so I'm engaged in the parliamentary activities with the ASEAN parliamentarians, IPAN, etc. cetera. Um, we're trying to work at that level as well. Ben, can I say something? Yes, okay. I mean, thanks, Karen. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, say that like, you know, I mean, like recognizing NUG is not only like by recognizing them per se, you know, like if that is, you know, by diplomatically in some way, it's not I mean, in real politics, let's put it that way, <laughs> if it's not possible, but there are other practical 
actions to 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 recognize the NUG or the people's will is such as like for example sanction the first number one and number two sanction may online and so when why not right mm -hmm. I mean you know in 2018 Australia sanctioned five military officers who are you know in in, in response to the Rohingya genocide mm -hmm. but then why not uh, sanction the uh, May online since then, who is the you know like uh, in charge of the the command uh, of the the Rohingya genocide? So my point here is, um, of course, if there is a will, there is always you know if there is a will, there are always you know way. Which which I think uh, for the Australian government, I would think I would I think as a first step, even to take the you know, like a sanction these two military generals will be a will be a, a big uh, step the people of Myanmar and the NUG will greatly greatly appreciate it because it falls in the cause of you know, under the cause of the the people's desire no well, thanks thanks Kenoma and thanks Janelle I think you make a good point about parliamentarians there as well because if there are difficulties around acknowledging a government we can certainly acknowledge that these are legitimate parliamentarians and there might be more interesting ways for Southeast Asian parliamentarians as well and others to do more um, Scott, I think you were trying to come in as well. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to um, a couple points that Janelle and, and Ken Omar said and, and in response to um, uh, to Nicholas, Ambassador Nicholas Koppel's uh, question. And um, I think at this point, you know, we're, we're the, the international community has a limited role here. I mean, most this the outcome in Myanmar is going to be decided mostly by people in Myanmar as it as it should be. Um, but I think part of the calculation for the international community is to try to change the calculations of the military leaders. And part of that involves um, trying to get them to come to the conclusion that they can't really win. Um, I, I think they expected that this would coup would be accepted both domestically and internationally much more than it has been. It's really important that they continue to believe that it's not accepted and that there's not really any way out. To me, the end state, um, the end goal realistically, and again, I defer to the Myanmar people, I'm, a, I'm an outsider, is for the junta to reach the point that they said, this isn't working, we need to try to find a way out. And part of that is no matter what you do, the people of the country aren't gonna accept this coup and the world's not gonna accept you. Um, and I think that's why the, uh, whether it's recognition or just dialogue with the NUG mm -hmm. and um, avoiding anything that confers legitimacy on the military is part of that overall strategy. Before we turn to more questions from the audience, I want to turn to the elephant in the room, which is China. Beijing obviously has big interests and big leverage in Myanmar with its long land border, extensive trade and investment relationships, good political connections in the past with Aung San Suu Kyi and perhaps more troubled relationship with the Tatmadaw. Um, but China has called for the release of Aung San Suu Kyi, a return to stability, but it seems reluctant, like a lot of Myanmar's near neighbors, to exert too much pressure. I mean, Scott, I wonder here if Myanmar is one of those issues where the US and China might be able to collaborate where they can, as uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken put it recently. I mean, do you think there's more that the US could be doing with China quietly to try and get on the same page, even if their approaches is different? Isn't the desired end goal the same in Myanmar for now? Um, yeah, and, and to be honest, I'm not privy to whatever conversations are happening between Washington and Beijing on this. I, I, I just don't, don't really know. But, um, and I certainly can't speak for the Chinese government, but my sense would be that this coup and certainly the, the, all the turmoil and violence in the aftermath, it, I don't see how it's in China's interest. Uh, um, again, my sense is that China wants stability um, and uh, for a whole host of reasons. And so my guess is they're not thrilled with this, uh, but they're being cautious. Um, so um, there may be some shared interest between the United States and China in this in certainly ending the violence um, and the instability and going back to, not going back, I should say going forward, because I think going back isn't an option. Going forward to a situation where the people of the country are sufficiently satisfied with governance mm -hmm. that they're willing to, to move forward or whatever that entails. So yeah, there may be an opportunity. Um, again, working um, US and China with others, including ASEAN to see if there's enough common ground there. 
Yeah, I know, I know that there's been talk of an ASEAN foreign ministers meeting with potentially Secretary of State Blinken and, and Wang Yi from China involved as well. Uh, Pat Rizal, do you think that's, that's likely? Can, can ASEAN be the force that actually brings the US and, and China together in a meaningful way on, on the Myanmar question? Uh, two points. One is, of course, you know, ASEAN expect that, you know, uh, both, you know, the U.S. And, 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 and China, you know, can can do uh, and, and then work, you know, on their, on their own, you know, in order to uh, create change, you know, in Myanmar. Uh, uh, so, you know, so, you know, I don't I don't think that ASEAN in a position to say, you know, criticize the sanction that imposed by the U.S. on the generals. And I don't think that ASEAN will ever also criticize China for not imposing or for not taking the same uh, policies, you know, with, with the U.S. That's the first point. The second point is that ASEAN just hope that whenever, what, whatever plan that, you know, we are going to have, you know, on the ground in Myanmar, then, you know, the US and China can, you know, also help to contribute, you know, to that uh, uh, plan in the future. You know, here we are thinking about, for example, eh, on the humanitarian, you know, assistance. It requires a huge, you know, I think operation once it's agreed upon, you know, by parties in, in, in Myanmar. So that's where, you know, I think, uh, ASEAN would expect the support from, from, from the US, the support from, from China, and so far only Australia already pledged support, you know, uh, 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 one day after uh, the uh, summit. And then I think ASEAN really appreciate that, you know, because, you know, uh, they need all those support, you know, uh, in order to, you know, to move ahead. Uh, I'm going to turn to questions from the audience. We've been inundated, which is, is great. So thanks so much. And I'll try to get through as many as I can, but apologies if we don't get through them all. But if the panelists can respond quickly, then hopefully we can get through more questions. So the, the first one is from Tony Betts. Um, and he asks about the level of gender inequality in Myanmar society. So given this gender inequality, how will the crisis impact women? And how can we address this imbalance? So Kinoma, I might come to you first on that one. Thank you. Yeah, the gender inequality has been, of course, you know, like a Burma politics, Myanmar politics always been male dominated um, traditionally. But I have to say that over the, especially over the last 10 years, uh, women really strive hard to, you know, like uh, to, to take the, the important roles, decision making, being a part of the peace process and all of that, you know, like leading in the uh, like a civil society act, uh, sector. But um, Right now, with this coup, um, no, no, there, there's, of course, there, like, and you can imagine of like, you know, what is really happening right now, especially the young, the, this movement, you know, like uh, women are at the, at the forefront, especially the young women. Uh, now, many of them are, you know, like in detention, uh, facing the, like a sexual assault, sexual violence and rape, and uh, including the LGBTIQ, uh, uh, they are all facing, you know, like extreme um, uh, violence like this. Um, but again, we have to see that you know, like this uh, Myanmar military, uh, they have used uh, all along, they've used the like uh, rape and sexual violence against the ethnic women, you know, like uh, in their campaigns in the, you know, throughout. So there is this, this impunity is so entrenched and embedded when it comes to uh, sexual violence against women in the, in the, in the, in the society. So right now, what we really need is we need to uh, we need all the help we can to get the support uh, from international community for these women by like supporting the women actors in the movement, including those in the national unity government. That there are many ministers taking the post. Uh, women are taking the ministry of post, and they need they need the support. And, and, and like uh, also these uh, women human rights defenders, activists, journalists. And like uh, then they, their names need to be called out and their release must be called uh, I mean, like uh, demanded and um, their families must be supported and also you know, like uh, demanding for them to have access to the uh, legal um, uh, legal assistance. So there are many of these uh, practical needs are, 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 are needing at the moment. There are many women in the ethnic areas, you know, there's so much of the, that the, the what do you call like a humanitarian ne needs are also there. The uh, women organizations are very strong in Myanmar, very resilient. Also, the, the, their capacity is enormous, and they know how to what to do and how to do it. What they need is the practical support, including the financial support for the cross-border aid, in order to get the assistance to the, the needy people, including the women and children in the country. Yeah. Thanks, Kenoma. Um, the next question is from Emma Connors from the Australian Financial Review, who's asking about the Yadana gas project which is a huge gas project involving Chevron from the US, France's Total and I think Myanmar Oil and Gas Group. Um, and she's asking, should multinational parties in the Yadana gas field and pipeline shut down production? 
I might ask you, Scott, because you were talking about cutting off sources of, of finance. So you know, do you think this is what should happen? Chevron and other multinational oil and gas companies should be shutting down their projects to cut off the, the flow of money? Or do you think that would have potentially negative knock-on effects? Um, I think that um, this is, I assume this is being looked at by a lot of governments, uh, perhaps including my own, I'm not sure. Um, I think it, it depends on, on, on sort of going through the various scenarios and how would it play out. Um, if there is a, I mean, some, a lot of that gas, for example, goes to Thailand. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what are the implications of, of cutting off that gas? I think the ideas I've heard have been not so much pulling out or cutting off, but possibly paying the royalties or whatever it's called uh, into a, uh, an escrow fund as opposed to paying it to uh, the government, um, uh, you know, if, if it can be done in a way that that squeezes the government, um, uh, then I think it's certainly something that should be looked at. But I just don't know enough about the details of how the operation and the financial flows work to say absolutely. And, and, and Janelle, more generally, do you think mm -hmm. that the private sector has a responsibility um, here to, to, to put more pressure on, on the military? And, and what, what should they be doing? And there's a lot of Australia and a lot of US, a lot of Southeast Asian companies who went into Myanmar in the last few years with promise of high growth. How, how do you think they should be responding to try and get the best outcome? They should, they should use leverage they've got, the commercial, the economic leverage to put pressure on the regime because we all talk about pressure to stop the killing, do all the things. So use it um, in the when um, the coup happened and um, um, Dr. Tunnell was detained, I spoke to the head of Woodside, um, our company, you know, Australia's, and asked him to do everything he could possibly do. I mean, I did that quietly, not so quietly now, but, um, you know, so <laughs> there's things like that we can do. There is a group, as I referred to before, of serious economist bankers working on how that money, as you say, Scott, can be directed into an escrow account, the money that would be paid to General Minong Line and all the two companies of the military. And um, in the court of a public opinion, that would certainly be popular and looking at the legal basis of it because the companies have contractual. You know, I can say, look, Chevron, get out. I said that in 1990, I think, or whatever it was. <laughs> it's not going to, they're not going to get out no matter what we say. So let's, the ones that are there, let's work with them and get the best we can for the people um, and the people's representatives. Thanks. And ben, next can question I say is... something very quickly? Okay, Sorry. sure. Can I say, yeah, I just want to say that our civil society organizations, more than 400 have been sending letters to Total and Chevron and mm -hmm. the call is very simple. Um, stop making the payment to this military hunter. Instead, you know, like a reserve, like a, uh, what do you call, like a put those money in the, uh, the secure account for the people yeah. of Burma until the democracy is done. So it's a very clear call and I hope they will actually comply to that. Yeah. Thanks, Kenema. Um, next question is from Ralph Kossa for Pat Rizal. Um, given that ASEAN consensus makes any meaningful response unlikely, is it time for Indonesia to step up unilaterally uh, with Jokowi threatening to recognize the NUG as the legitimate government if the junta doesn't take action to stop the killing immediately? Well, you know, it's not a habit of Pak Jokowi to issue threats, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and I think uh, even though, you know, Indonesia will always, you know, prefer to work, you know, within, within ASEAN, but of course, as a sovereign state, you know, we also have our own, you know, uh, options available on the table. So, you know, I can't say that, you know, uh, if ASEAN, you know, fails, then, you know, Indonesia is not going to do anything. So I'm sure that, you know, there will be also other alternative options available. But again, Indonesia has no leverage in Myanmar, to be frank. You know, so whatever uh, options you know, available or we are considering to take if ASEAN can no longer uh, work on this issue. And then, of course, it must be done, you know, in, in coordination with other uh, actors and players as well. Um, thanks, Paris. Our next question is from Zareer Bamji. He says, yeah, the, the atrocities committed by the Tatmadaw are well known to everyone. Um, however, has anyone suggested a workable exit plan for them to consider, especially one that's acceptable to all parties? So 
yeah, is there an off ramp that can be offered to, to the tap model that they might take if this, you know, this coup does seem to have failed in some senses? Is there any way forward that could offer an exit ramp to, to minimum lying that the, the military would take and that the civil society in Myanmar would be happy with? What, what do you think, Kanema? I think the first and foremost important step is to ensure that this, this um, attempted coup is completely failed. In order for that to happen, is all of these uh, different uh, uh, punitive actions or pressure uh, uh, pressure that needs to be happened first. Only then, I would say only then, it will be for the Myanmar people uh, together with the national unity government to really engage with the international community for that exit uh, strategy. Uh, for the, the, the Tamador. I think for us to say right now, while the people are under the complete like you know, ter terror campaign uh, by this military hunter, it would not be uh, it would not be fair to our people. It would not be uh, um, uh, not the right time to actually uh, talk about it until this military comes to be stopped. I think that's I mean the current uh, uh, violence come to be stopped. And only then I think that step will be should be uh, uh, discussed or, or you know you all should be hear out from the people of Myanmar because only then Myanmar people will also be able to think of what would be the exit strategy for this military. Of course, you know, like uh, pra pra pragmatically, everybody knows that you know this military cannot be kicked into the Indian Ocean. Uh, by that, you know, like uh, what what is the the way out and the the end the, the solution? But that solution can only be thought through carefully, and only when the violence is stopped. But also we know all of us, you know, throughout the history in Myanmar, Burma, we know that anti unless we address the military impunity, anti unless we hold these perpetrators for generations to account, anti unless we include the transitional justice that is accepted by the Myanmar people, whatever the solution will not be sustainable even though let's say that it is imposed by the, the Myanmar people, by the outside actors, it will not be a, 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 a sustainable solution that we will see the vicious cycle come back again and again. Yeah. And what about Janelle? I know you talked to a lot of different parties in Myanmar and you've dealt with a lot of people in the military in the past. Do you see any kind of way they can be convinced to take an off ramp? They, they're worried about the International Court of Justice case they're worried about the ICC and they're worried about their money and, and also their status. So there's four things that they worry about at the moment. The 2008 constitution, which they say is alive, but which is dead um, in the eyes of the civilian actors in the government, um, it's got some protection in there for them. And, you know, it, but I agree with Kino Ma, it's a bit soon to be heading down that track, but they're the things I know they're scared of. And people often say they're impervious. My sort of somewhat 30 years experience of watching them um, tells me they're not impervious. And, you know, they do want to be part of, uh, the international community in some way. They certainly do the regional community. You know, they want to be that. And I'll just tell a little story that, you know, I hadn't told till recently, but um, when I was meeting with some of, some of President Uthain Sain's ministers, his key six, they asked me how to get him a Nobel Peace Prize. And I kept a straight face. And I said, someone, I said, well, and they talked about South Africa, of course. And I said, well, some, you actually have to do something. They were, that was a negotiated settlement. This is a decreed process in Myanmar. But the point I'm coming to, I could tell more stories like that. And, um, but they do want recognition in some way. So, you know, they're the factors, but in terms of the politics of it, no, not now. And a question from Amanda Hodge from The Australian. Um, she asking Pat Rizal, um, some say that the ASEAN meeting has allowed countries like Australia to sit back and simply say they're following ASEAN's lead, using it as a cover not to act. Uh, do you think countries like Australia should do more? And I guess you could even argue the same for, for the US and, and India and Japan and others. Are they hiding behind ASEAN? No, I think, you know, we already discussed, you know, that point, you know, so I do believe that uh, you know, Australia is, uh, can also, of course, you know, do more unilaterally, 
but you know, I think you know there are a lot of you know opportunities you know, for Australia to work you know with 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 ASEAN. You know, if you know the uh, plans you know uh, uh, go through uh, in 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 the next you know few weeks. So I, I don't I don't I don't you know really see that you know some countries are hiding behind uh, ASEAN or not hiding behind ASEAN. Um, I, if, if I may, and I would like to go back to the, that point, you know, of the way out. So I think the, the third model should take this, you know, temporary way out offered by ASEAN at the moment. So mm -hmm. which is, you know, they have to stop the violence. Then, you know, we can actually uh, start preparing for the humanitarian assistance. Then, of course, it's really up to the uh, uh, people of Myanmar themselves to decide what sort of political, you know, uh, solution uh, that they, they want to have, you know, in the third uh, elements of the consensus, the so-called inclusive, uh, dialogue. Dialogue is only, you know, one uh, format, if you like, you know, in order to find the political solution. There are a lot of models that, you know, we, we can uh, take lessons from, either the, 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 the South Korean model, if you remember in 19, uh, 1998, I think, in 1988, uh, uh, when they get rid of this military dictatorship as well, and that they kill all the generals. <laughs> and there is also Indonesian model, you know, or Thai model, if you like. So, you know, <laughs> these uh, models, you know, I think, can serve as the reference, but not the, 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 the you know the recipe for, for Myanmar. The Myanmar themselves, you know, need to find what sort of arrangement. But I think the, the bottom line is that the military should withdraw from politics. That's universal in any democracy. It's true in Indonesia, it's true also you know, in, in South Korea, and true also in many Latin American countries. And then I think we made a mistake, you know, Scott, you know, in, in, in 2010 to 2015, you know, we thought democratization process in Myanmar already, you know, done deal, but actually it was not. So we didn't, you know, help them with the military reform, like, you know, what a lot of, you know, uh, uh, Indonesian friends did in Indonesia from 98, you know, to 2005. Then can just... I say something very quickly? Yeah, um, sure. Um, uh, just to follow on Park Reserve is also like Myanmar people are basically saying like, you know, we're done with this military. What that means is that they, they want to see the military completely out of the politics and business as well but also one thing a uh, very important point when i said that the, the first step uh, the first benchmark in order to take to the next level to think about what is the way out will be the to end the violence that includes the release of you know more than four thousand uh getting to almost getting to almost five thousand people that they have already detained and that those you know, like uh, detainees uh, must be released in that, you know, concept of the and uh, ending the violence. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So we just have two minutes left. So I'm going to get the last question from Teresa Ball, a barrister, uh, which I'll give to Scott first and then Janelle for the last word, but one minute each. Uh, what are your predictions for where Myanmar goes next? E an easy question in 60 mm. seconds. Um, I, uh, you know, there's, it's really impossible to predict. I would say the most likely scenario over the next several months, which is as far as I could go, is sadly probably more of the same. Um, I don't see either side. I don't see the, the, the top medal giving in. Uh, I certainly don't see the people accepting this coup. Um, I, I hope there is a way that, that um, uh, the ASEAN initiative can, can make a little bit of headway and begin a process, but most likely scenario sadly is more of the same, uh, which means a lot more suffering, uh, sadly. And Janelle, um, where do you think things are going? And maybe to, to lift things up, what, what can the rest of us practically do uh, to help, I guess? Look, it will be more of the same for a while because General Min Ong Line says stability has to return before he'll consider the five points consensus of ASEAN. He made that announcement. Um, but what we can do, I agree with Scott, back in the back in that consensus with ASEAN, but still act unilaterally. So we do both things, um, operate there and support the people of Myanmar don't support the military because, and it, it's hard to predict where it will go, but I will predict ultimately General Min Ong Line will fail and the people or peoples of Myanmar will prevail. Well, let, let's hope you're right, Janelle. So thanks so much for your insights. Thanks, Scott, Pat Rizal and Kin Omar as well. And thank you everyone. Uh, for listening to this Lowy Institute event and see you all next time soon. Bye-bye uh, for now.